Okay, well, welcome back for episode four, I think it is, of Communist Radio. And um, we've got Cal here this time. Um, Cal's our, well, you're a London organizer and a, a pretty regular writer on the Middle East, Palestine, these kind of questions for communist.red, for the newspaper, and for marxist.com. And I mean, the main thing we're talking about, unsurprisingly, once again, is the Middle East and specifically the invasion by Israel of Lebanon. And, and in particular, look, Marxist.com uh, and, and the Revolutionary Communist International is putting out various statements, articles, podcasts, and everybody should should look at all of that for the general international situation and the broader picture. I think we should specifically focus on the question of Starmer and his response. Do you want? Can you just Cal talk us through what that has been like? Yeah. Well, did you see his televised address on Tuesday? Yeah, <laughs> it's, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. Good, good. Yeah, I saw it on Twitter the day after, uh, unfortunately. And in this, he spoke about uh, the region being pushed ever closer to the brink. He's talking about the Middle East. He's talking about the chaos and destruction, all mm -hmm. of these things. And uh, what was missing from this address was any comment about the spate of murderous attacks that the Israeli yeah. state had been carrying out over the last couple of weeks. Instead, it was Iran. Uh, that, that is the culprit behind yeah. what is taking place in the Middle East. Sole responsibility for the escalation, for the dangerous situation was placed on Iran's shoulders. And Israel is the victim. Uh, yeah. That's what I found out on Tuesday. Yeah. And it's a, it, this total distortion. I was actually talking to someone else um, earlier in the week and she was saying, the, and she's got family in the region, and she was saying they're just lying. Yeah. They are, how are they? How are they? Like Starmer, the media, how are they all just lying in with such barefaced um, abandon that they are, and they're getting away with it, and they're being allowed to get away with it. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if you saw an address when uh, the the pager attack took place, which even according to a CIA official is a state sponsored act of terrorism. Yeah. I I can't remember Starmer getting on the steps of Downing Street or uh, standing behind a podium and condemning the actions of the Israeli state there, or when they uh, launched airstrikes into Iran, into Syria, the blowing up of embassies, mm -hmm. the assassination attempts, and uh, the successful assassinations they've managed to carry out. There has been nothing in the way of condemnation. Yeah, that's it. That, I mean, that's right. And it's it's the exact opposite, in fact. Starmer and Lamy have come out and said that they support Israel, uh, that they'll back it all the way. Biden has said he fully, fully backs Israel, mm -hmm. even as, as it is carrying these things out. And I mean, it is striking as well, because last week at the UN in the Security Council, Starmer gave a big speech that was reported, I was reading about it in The Guardian, mm -hmm. which, you know, this is a The Guardian, liberal, left, left thing, left newspaper. It has also come out very much on the side, parroting the line basically of the BBC and of the British establishment that this is all Iran's fault and, uh, and and Israel is not to blame at all, it's the victim. Yeah, so I was reading in The Guardian about this address by Starmer at the UN where he says to Russia, he's just the Russian representative, you have invaded Ukraine, it's illegal what you've done, uh, countless civilians, 35,000 civilians have been killed. You've threatened global security. You're causing colossal human suffering. He says that pretty much in the same breath uh -huh. as saying, but we back Israel fully. There's and he, he says that just after making an unsuccessful trip to Washington, yeah. where he was trying to drag the Americans into sending uh, or allowing uh, Ukraine to operate the Storm Shadow missiles, which could only be operational with British or American personnel. That's Essentially, right. Putin said that this would be an act of war. Yeah. So after flirting with World War Three, there, he then comes to the UN to condemn Russia. Yeah, that's right. That's it. And it, it, this this barefaced hypocrisy. This is, I think, is a major job of communists to to highlight this, basically, to try and expose this. And it is being exposed. Very, it doesn't even rely on communists to expose it. It is being exposed right now. But as uh, as another comrade put it to me earlier in the week, will you know when when Russia invaded Ukraine, there was all this uh, hullabaloo about national sovereignty and mm -hmm. things like this and international law. And where is that now in relation to Lebanon? That is a sovereign state that has been invaded by its by its neighbour. It's, there's this massive bombing campaign taking place. Thousands of civilians have been killed in mm -hmm. Lebanon already. 
and there's no sign that's going to stop. Where is the outrage, the moral outrage? Mm. It's all being discussed in the media and by Starmer in technical military terms. Yes. There's no, there's no uh, horror about international law and the rights of nations. Is Starmer going to invite uh, the, the leaders of Lebanon to address the UK <laughs> cabinet as he did with Zelensky, for example? Yeah. Is he going to fly the Lebanese flag from all of the government buildings as this poor country that's been invaded by its imperialist, aggressive neighbor? Mm. Is he, is he going to start providing it with weaponry, with tanks, with missiles and all kinds of, and three billion a year as he's providing for Ukraine? He's not. And the only difference is there's, there's nothing, there's no moral or principle difference <clears throat> here. It's purely to do with the interests of Western imperialism. That is the difference. Yes, absolutely. I think um, it's very clear that the rules-based order is, uh, is very selective in its use. It's, it's used to condemn the enemies of uh, Western imperialism. But whenever one of its allies, its friends, its friends in Tel Aviv, for instance, are to break every single rule in the book, uh, they willingly turn a blind eye. What has the last year been but exactly that? They've turned a blind eye with the devastation that they've wrought upon Palestine. Mm. Uh, the collective punishment they've wrought upon 2.3 million people in the Gaza Strip. And now Netanyahu is uh, talking about the next stage of the war, all under the auspices of security, uh, of course. Yes. And uh, he's talking about uh, turning Beirut into Gaza City. Mm. They, they made these threats actually months and months ago. And uh, he's obviously waited for the perfect opportunity to do so. But of course, the, the hypocrisy is enough to make you choke mm. when it comes to these things. And uh, we've heard a lot about the, the right of Israel to self-defense, the right for her to defend herself. He used it actually in the, the televised pitch he gave to the nation. But with this right, it seems to preclude any other people or proxy or nations uh, using such a right mm. against Israel against the terrorist state um, that is wreaking havoc in the region. Yeah. It seems to be very selective where they where they choose to draw the line. Yeah, and that, and that it's not just Starmer and Lamy and, and the establishment, the British government, the US government being exposed to be hypocrites, but it's the entire, as you said, the, the, rule, the international rules-based order. The international institutions are completely, the UN are completely incapable of doing anything about this. Mm -hmm. And... The media also is being exposed, but even even in a whole uh, look, Starmer has talked a lot. He it, rec up until recently, and even now, he keeps talking about a ceasefire. Mm. He, oh, well, we want a ceasefire in Gaza. We want a ceasefire in Lebanon, yeah. and that uh, that pacifism is actually a common trait, I would say, of uh, of, of reformists, of left reformists. But it's it's all pacifism really is. This is this is what the Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky described as. He described pacifism as a servant of imperialism. Yes. And you are seeing that being exposed really clearly right now. Because yeah. pacifism, that whole idea of a ceasefire, first of all, what would what would a ceasefire bring? Mm. I you remember return to the status quo. Exactly that. I remember I remember you and me discussing this back in October last year. Yeah when the calls for a ceasefire and, and stuff came out around Gaza. And we were saying, yeah, but all a ceasefire would do is put it back to what it was like on October the 6th, mm. which is which is not what we want. That's yeah. no solution to the problems faced by, the, the the oppression faced by Palestinian people. That's no solution at all. Yeah. So that's like an, uh, an imperialist peace mm. is not that much different from an imperialist war. And in fact, they always use uh, pieces to prepare the next ground campaign, when you yes. look at the the long arc of um, of of the uh, the impact that Zionism has had in this in this region, it's always been preparing for the next war. And I think you know clearly what uh, differentiates how we understand war is we understand it's a continuation of politics by different means. Uh, we're very fond of using the Clausewitz expression. Which, and I think in the case of imperialist pieces that, uh, that Israel has, um, <clears throat> has agreed to in the past, it has been a continuation of low-level war um, mm. wherever you look. For instance, there is a silent war taking place in the West Bank, which gets no media attention whatsoever. There is still the occupation there. There is uh, settlers that uh, act with impunity, terrorizing people, raining down hell on, uh, on poor Palestinian villages, all of the illegal outposts in the West Bank and so on. Is that a war? Does that count? Mm. I think that is something that's often uh, completely missed out. Yeah, that's right. And, that, and, and this... 
this pacifism, this calls for a ceasefire, completely ignores all those kind of questions. Mm. And 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 more than that as well, it 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 justifies um, or it, yeah, it justifies imperialism. It covers up the crimes of imperialism. That's mm. what pacifism does because it basically says, "Oh look, this is a horrible aberration. This yeah. is a, this is something that doesn't need to happen." And and if if only we could all you know get our heads screwed on, we this wouldn't be happening basically. Yes. And it's the idea that you can persuade imperialists that they don't need to go to war. That you can persuade the Israeli regime that it doesn't need to go to war, for example. Mm. And that is simply not true because war is the product of an imperialist system. Imperialism is the highest stage of capitalist development. Mm. This is embedded into the the framework, the foundations of the capitalist system. Yes. And and pacifists like Starmer, well, he's not he's being exposed as barely even a pacifist, <laughs> but someone who goes around saying a ceasefire, this is what we want, in actual fact is just trying to paper, is just trying to cover up the, yeah. the real class divisions that exist in society and across the world. And and it results in war, which then he cries tears about, but ends up supporting anyway. And yeah. pacifists, in fact, end up being warmongers. It's it, I think you're exactly right. It's a very inconsistent position when you look at uh, what Starmer has said over the past year. At points, it's uh, it's been focused on peace, peace in the abstract, peace on Israel's terms always, of course, and ceasefire. That's kind of what we got a flavor of at the UN uh, last week as well, when he simply said that Israel and Hezbollah should just stop the violence, as if you could simply declare that into existence. But when push comes to shove, he always sides with the oppressor nation. He always sides with Israeli imperialism. And Israeli imperialism and Netanyahu has made it very clear since October last year that it do- is not interested in a ceasefire. Mm. You know, it's falling on deaf ears. And in fact, what they're more interested in doing is ramping up the war in order to push through their interests, which if you look at the long-term interests of Zionism, have been either to expel Palestinians from the land or to exterminate uh, exterminate them entirely. That's what we're dealing with here, right? This isn't because Netanyahu is a a particularly evil individual, though of course he definitely is. It's it's the it's the 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 interests of Israeli imperialism that he represents, and that from the very beginning, since October seventh, and even before then as well, but from October seventh, Starmer rushed in to say, "Our support is ironclad. Here is a blank check. Do what you please." So of yes. course he's found himself in this inconsistent position, but it's always in support of the violence perpetrated by the Israeli state. Yes. That's exactly it. And unless you understand that, unless we all understand that, we're not going to get very far. So mm. it is important for communists to, to try and brush aside or, or penetrate this, this nonsense of pacifism and ceasefire. It's a product, this stuff is a product of class interests, of imperialist interests. Yeah. And the only way to fight it then, it's not with pacifism, it's with you fight uh, imperialist war with class war, with yes. class struggle. Yeah not with reformist pacifism and trying to persuade the imperialists not to not to act in this way. I think that's important. And unfortunately, that is something very absent of the Palestine solidarity movement across the globe. Yeah. Or from the trade union leadership as well, that has not even lifted a finger uh, to uh, to stop the, the transport of arms to Israel or anything of that matter. Yeah, that is true. And actually, I think this came out a little bit. You saw this when... Just after Starmer got elected, he did and said a couple of things that I think some uh, yeah. soft liberal left types thought, "Oh, this is this is a big change." Like, like tempering the position, exactly. Because he did what was it that he did? He did um, he made a couple of statements. He he restored the funding, for example, to the uh, UNRWA. UNRWA. Yeah, that's right. And withdrew the objection that the British government had lodged to the prosecution by the International Court of uh, of Netanyahu. Um, and people said, "Oh well, this." And, and, he, and he made even at the Labour Party conference, he made a speech about how he wanted a ceasefire and mm. and a, a Palestinian state and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But I think this is this is a good example of of, of why it's important not to believe that kind of nonsense when yes. it comes out, unless you see things in class terms, unless you can penetrate through that nonsense. Otherwise, you get carried away with that uh, that yeah. pacifist stuff. Basically, you buy it, you believe it. I saw a lot of nonsense online when this so called Temp, uh, this partial arms embargo was introduced. You know the the banning of something like thirty arms licenses yeah, to, right. to Israel, out of a total of three hundred and fifty. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember 
listening to what David Lammy was saying at the time, he said that this is not uh, us suggesting that Israel has even committed a crime. This is just us deciding to do it in case uh, mm. things develop in a certain way, right? We don't want to be too complicit. It was such an obvious maneuver to try distance the Labour Party from a genocide that is taking place and everyone can see it. People do not need the ICJ to say whether or not the International Court of Justice to decide whether or not a genocide is taking place. They just need to listen to what Netanyahu yes. has said. They need to look at the actions that have been carried out in Gaza. That makes it simple enough in people's minds. So people are very different from the Labour government, which said, oh, we have to wait on what the courts have to say, what the UN has to say about these kind of things. People think it's bollocks, and I think they're completely right to think so. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, and yeah, I think I think the way we've been talking as well here is quite important because for us, the main enemy, our main, we're here in London. the The, the main enemy is Starmer and the British mm. government. This is this is where we have to focus our yes our efforts and our attention. Um, because obviously, in in the region itself, okay, Iran has has retaliated, as we know, it's fired its missiles. The Lebanese people, the Palestinian people, are are fighting back against this imperialist aggressor as they have every right to do yes um and, and that actually is an important point because um communists we are always on the side of the oppressed we're always on the side of the people fighting against imperialism yeah. obviously that doesn't mean we uh we cheerlead or flag wave for all the methods that are used we're communists we have our methods we have our slogans and our banners but they are all methods and slogans and directed against imperialist aggression. And we are on the side of the oppressed at all times. Mm -hmm. But obviously the main question for us here in, in Britain is what can we do to aid the oppressed people of Lebanon, of Palestine, for example, the yes. people who are uh, struggling against this, this Israeli invasion or in the case of Palestine, this genocide. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think, I think the main thing to understand is that Britain is a major component part of Western imperialism. Yeah. And, and, and it's Western imperialism that props up that Israeli, that Zionist war machine. Because that, at the end of the day, is what we're all fighting against, mm. is well, what we want to see as an end to the Zionist, uh, the Zionist state, the, the, that war machine, that Israeli war machine. And... That is only kept going by aid from the West, by military aid from the West, by diplomatic support, financial support, and so on. And here we are in the West with where, where there's a large working class and a lot of very angry people, people angry against the government, the establishment, and everything else, both mm. in this country, in the United States. Here we are with all of that anger, which we can use to direct against that. That, for, in my opinion, that is the best way. That is the best weapon we have that yes. we can use to fight against Israeli imperialism. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. And I, I would say after a year of marching, after a year of demonstrations, rallies, political meetings, all of this sort of thing, um, people might feel a little bit demoralized mm. by the lack of results. The demonstrations have been subject to the law of diminishing returns as well. It's just been doing the same thing again and again and again. I imagine we're going to see a resurgence this weekend for the, the, the demonstration. That's very likely because, of course, it's a year. It marks a year since the, the genocide began. But I think people shouldn't feel hopeless or demoralized in a country like Britain. Of course, what we see in front of us is the horror of the capitalist system and the horrendous actions that our, uh, our government will do in order to continue to uh, further its material interests in the Middle East shows just how far they will go. But that does not uh, reflect what people think. That does not reflect the world that people want to live in as well. And um, I think what should fill us with confidence is the fact we can actually do something. And of course, the Revolutionary Communist Party here in Britain and uh, across our international as well, we've been raising the slogan of the main enemy is at home. That is the main enemy that we can attack, we can agitate against, we can organize against. And uh, I think the first task to do in this is to strip the halo from the heads of our rulers that claim to be the, uh, the torchbearers of democracy and peace mm -hmm. and all of this. They're doing a good job at discrediting themselves anyway. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I don't think people buy that at all. That these guys, that Starmer or anyone else is um, 
is some standard bearer for everything that's right and good in the world. I think everyone can, I think to be honest, even before the election, people could see straight through that. Yes. It was a pivotal issue in the election, one that uh, led to a slightly depressed Labour vote and a lot of independent uh, MPs being elected on a pro-Palestine ticket. Yeah, that's it. And look, I mean, it's, it is a, a you, you raise this point about A to B marches and that there's limits, there's diminishing returns, there's limits to what that can achieve. And I think that's true. Um, we'll still be there. Obviously, the, the RCP will be at all the marches uh, talking to people. But it, it's certainly true that we've got to go, there's got to be more beyond that. And there are, there is activity going on beyond that. There's, uh, there's, uh, sabotage of of uh, Israeli military operation, you know, weapons uh, manufacturers, for example, based in this country. Mm. There's things like that, which, although they're good, they they at the moment they're being done on an individual basis, yeah. which is fine, and it is delivering some results, no doubt about that. But mm. much more effective, I think, and m- more guaranteed to deliver the results. We actually had this discussion in Newcastle, the RCP comrades in Newcastle, were mm. part of this campaign. And this question got brought up. What is the most effective way to shut down this weapons manufacturer? Mm. And it can be by individual action, for example. Uh, but it could also be, and, and probably more effective, if you base yourself on the history of, of other struggles of this kind, to involve the workers involved in the production of yes. those weapons. Yes. That's the way to get inside the factory. It's, it's harder, yeah. but it's more guaranteed to deliver results. Absolutely. You involve the working class in that way. And then you can think beyond that as well. There are, right now in the US... Uh, there's dockers on strike. Yeah. It's not over the question of Palestine. It's not over that issue at all. But there's dockers on strike and it is costing the US economy billions of dollars mm. every every week that they're on strike. That is the impact that a small number of organized workers can have. And you could have boycotts, arms embargoes. You could the, the ports in Britain obviously play a role. And other other industries in Britain play a role. They rely on workers and workers could could boycott those things, could bring the economy to a, to a grinding halt. I think that's the point, really. And there is a long tradition of workers' boycotts, really planting the flag of internationalism in the ground. Back in October, um, the, the Palestine Confederation of Trade Unions put out a call to, uh, to its class brothers and sisters across the world saying, we need your help in, um, in boycotting the uh, arms shipments to Israel that they were calling on working class people to use their strength, the strength that they get from the role that they play within production to uh, make it clear that they do not want to be complicit in any part of this genocide. There's been many examples of this up in Scotland as well in, in the 1970s. You had the, uh, the workers at a factory refuse to service some engines, I think, that were being used by uh, Pinochet's military junta. And the people there realized that the ordinary people that were being murdered uh, as a result of Pinochet's coup were people like themselves, ordinary people, trade unionists. And they came out um, and said, we will not do this. Ne, ne pasaran. There's a very good documentary about it. I think as well with a workers boycott, it shows the potential that exists there latent in society for workers to control production and put it to their own use. A lot of pe- people at these factories, a lot of people generally in life don't actually like what they do in work and their skills are completely wasted Everything is is about bureaucratic targets. What can make a profit for your boss? That's that's the way that the world looks. And um, I think people, of course, can begin to see that their strength comes from the fact they produce the value in society and they can do far more than shut down an arms factory for one day here or there. They can grind all of society to a halt and actually build a society that isn't built on supporting genocide that isn't yes. built on the ruthless exploitation of people here at home as well. I think I think that's exactly it, and it's the idea that we should we should advocate and, and encourage and organise class struggle methods, yeah. which can lead to bigger questions. It leads to these bigger ideas, and people raises everybody's sights to what is possible. Yeah. And ultimately, what is possible and necessary in this country is that is the overthrow of this government. Yes, because as we were talking about before, you're not going to convince them with clever pacifistic or moralistic arguments that they, that they should not be supporting Israel. They mm. do it because they're a key link, the British ruling class is a key link in the chain of Western imperialism mm. and Western imperialism backs Israel. Israel is also part of that, yes. that network of Western imperialism. You cannot convince them out of that. Yep. All we can do is overthrow the government. All I we can do is, is break that link in that chain, basically. Yes. And that's really ultimately where we've got to get to through the through class struggle methods and organizing all these different things but that's the perspective we need to 
be raising. And if you think about it, that is what will... Imagine if Britain, instead all the money and resources and support that is currently flowing from Britain to Israel, imagine if that was then suddenly flowing towards revolutionary forces fighting against Israeli imperialism, fighting mm. against Western imperialism, mm. the massive impact that would make on mm. the struggle of the oppressed Palestinian people, for example, of the people in Lebanon now suffering under Israeli bombardment. Imagine the impact that would make. Imagine the impact it would make on revolutionary forces fighting, for example, in the US against yeah. their own government. Yeah. If we were to achieve that in Britain, it would have a massive impact. And that really, that it's not an easy thing, but that is what we have to focus on. That and. Honestly, apart from the Revolutionary Communist Party, mm. there is nobody else seriously with a serious strategy organizing for that. Yes. And that's, that's the point. Obviously, we are too small. Mm. That, that's the key uh, question here. We, have, we can see what needs to be done, mm. but the Revolutionary Communist Party is too small to do it at this stage, mm. which is why, as we've discussed in previous episodes, we're on a massive recruitment drive at the moment. Indeed. But if we can, if we can achieve that, if we can do that, that is the way that we can best help the Palestinian struggle, uh, the struggle in Lebanon and, and so on, the struggle against Western imperialism. And I think a lot of people are beginning to draw revolutionary conclusions on the basis of experience, not because they picked up a communist book, not because even they've come into contact with our organization here in Britain or our organization internationally. If you think what people have learned over the last year, it's an immense amount really. People could have gone into this movement. It might be the first time that they were protesting against Israel's barbarism. Take, take someone like that, an 18 year old, for example, they might have illusions in their government doing a nicer policy at first, but what will they have come up against? Yes. They, will, they will have seen with their own eyes that there is no way that you can dissuade imperialists from being imperialist. And in fact, the very fact that you're protesting against them means you're probably going to be victimized. You might even be criminalized yes. as, as we have seen across the so-called free West. Um, you might then have looked towards the uh, the ICJ ruling, um, South Africa's unprecedented case against Israel, um, questioning whether or not a genocide was taking place. Of course, this was an enormous embarrassment for yeah. the Israeli regime. This is not meant to happen, and it was, an, <laughs> and by extension, it was an enormous embarrassment for Britain and the U.S. that had said up until that point that everything was fine, everything uh, was, was going as planned, and they were just simply exerting their right to uh, self-defense. Then you see these court makers and, uh, and these uh, lawyers discussing the question of whether mass murder or genocide is a more appropriate title. Mm. And then you, wait, you see the ICC, uh, the International Criminal Court, say, we're going to potentially put out an arrest warrant for Netanyahu, and then there's pushback from the United States. You've seen all of this. I think people are quite naturally coming to the conclusion that in fact, it's not just that you can't entrust your own imperialist government, their, their institutions, the United Nations are not there for people like the Palestinians. Yes. They're not there for the oppressed masses of the world. And in fact, people then look at the people they see at the demonstrations, right? The hundreds of thousands, the millions in some cases of ordinary people whose hearts bleed for Palestine coming out week in, week out. And they say, well, maybe it's us that have to be something of yes. the solution. Maybe we need to be driving it forward. I think that's it. And I think this question, which we have always emphasized of, of a revolutionary change, yes. that is increasingly being seen as the only option because there is nothing else. There is no other avenue. And you're even seeing that on the demonstrations these days that we, we were pushing right at the start. A year ago, we started talking on the demonstrations. We used the word intifada, which means this like uprise, mass uprising of of ordinary people. Yeah. Now it's true that right now that is not really that is not a perspective in the Middle East itself, or certainly not in within the borders of historic Palestine. That that because of the the, the total destruction that the Israeli war machine has wrought across Gaza, for example, and and uh, the propaganda that exists uh, in, in across that whole society. That that's not really a uh, a realistic perspective in the region now. But the idea of intifada, the idea of a revolutionary uprising elsewhere including i would say in britain this is something that it is the only it's the only realistic alternative it's the only realistic solution yes and we've got to try and explain that and i think we will as you say i think we will find people who are quite interested in that and we will in fact be at this demonstration on saturday in central london as you say i imagine it'll be quite a big demonstration putting forward some of these ideas and trying to direct the anger towards the enemy at home, towards Starmer and, and try and find a solution on a revolutionary basis. Yeah. Uh, try and find people who are interested in that. 
Um, it's not a hard sell nowadays. It's not a hard sell. <laughs> I mean, we're going to be, what kind of slogans are we thinking that we might be using? What kind of stuff are we going to be putting out there? You got any the, plans? The kind of things we've talked about already, down with all the war criminals, mm -hmm. uh, healthcare, not warfare, books, not bombs. A lot of the material we used in Fiona's election campaign, which yeah. of course really struck a chord. Um, I think that campaign very skillfully connected the issue of Palestine with the issues that face ordinary people here in Britain as well. Because yeah, it's very obvious um, when you think about it, that the people that are willing to see horror without end um, in the Middle East, that are happy to, uh, to support Israel through to hell and high, high water, are the same people that are unleashing hell on ordinary people in this country. Um, Starmer has already made it very clear where he stands. I mean, he did this, mm. to be honest, for the, the, the previous years, right? It wasn't so much that he came close to office and then he reneged on a bunch yeah, of promises. Yeah, right. He was very pra practical. He said, it's better to make no promises at all than mm. break promises. <laughs> that was yeah. his election pitch before the election was even announced. Um, but he has made it very clear that tough decisions are on the order of the day. And what that will look like is permanent austerity, uh, more councils going bankrupt, the hospitals continuing to crumble, schools overfilled, class sizes exploding, all of this stuff. So a lot of people realize that when billions are being um, sent in military aid, they, they use that phrase from time yeah, to time, military. Just, just weaponry, basically. <laughs> just, well, just weaponry. When, when that's being sent either to, to Ukraine and Zelensky or Israel and Netanyahu or any of the, the merry men of the, uh, the imperialist West, that in fact, that's money that could be going into building up Britain. It could be going into hospitals, school, education, yeah, all of it. these kind of things. So I think there is a lot of anger that uh, exists and it's about channeling that as you were saying before, because we shouldn't feel helpless in, in a situation like this. There is something very concrete we can do, and that is build the forces of revolution to begin to fill the vacuum that you were describing. Yeah, that's it. So that's what we'll be putting forward at this at this demonstration on Saturday in, uh, in central London. And then next week, of course, is the 7th of October, the anniversary of the start of the genocide in, uh, in Palestine. Hmm. Now, all over the country, there, there will be meetings, uh, open meetings by Marxist societies or communist societies at universities, but also the Revolutionary Communist Party branch meetings will also be discussing uh, this question, this anniversary. Yes. And I think actually on top of that, there's rallies planned in, there's, I think there's rallies in London, in Edinburgh, in Manchester. We're, we're putting on some, the, the RCP is organizing some rallies and so on. Um, <clears throat> but this is something that I think we should briefly address. We heard a lot about well, this time last year, that Hamas started this whole thing with mm -hmm. their attack on October the 7th. Yes. And we're hearing that now about Hezbollah as well in yes. Lebanon, that, that they were the ones who started this by start, by firing rockets over the border on October the 8th, basically, and Israel is just defending itself. Mm -hmm. This is this is a right wing talking point, obviously, but this is something we should briefly, like, how, how are we answering that when we hear that? Because it's, it's rubbish. Yeah. How do we answer it? Yeah, I, I just to start with the, the point you just made, it's very noticeable that they've used the exact same logic, the same twisted logic to explain Iran's missile attacks mm. two days ago on Tuesday evening. Um, it shows maybe they're running out of material and they're just yeah. repeating the same talking points again and again. I mean, I think it's very obvious that the conflict between Israel and Palestine did not begin on October 7th. If you even look back on the, the whole of 2023 itself, what did we see? We saw raids in the Janine camp. We saw bombings, carpet bombings of Gaza. We saw provocations at the Al-Aqsa mosque compound. There was a very bloody start to the year with uh, settlers killing Palestinians in the West Bank. Of course, none of that is, is, uh, is included in the understanding that's presented by the Western media. And there's a very clear reason to, for that. In order for in, or, in order to claim that this is Israel using its right to, of self-defense, then it must begin with that initial attack, right? It must begin yes. with October 7th, with Hamas's incursion, because their argument doesn't make any sense if you, yeah. if you paint it otherwise. And um, I think in the, with the case of Lebanon, Israel invaded Le Lebanon before Hezbollah even existed. Mm -hmm. um, for one, there was a, an occupation of the South for, for 15 to 20 years. Um, I think ending the year of the, of the Second Intifada, 2000. 
There then was a 30, 34 day invasion in 2006. Every time they have gone in, it's been for national security purposes. I mean, the irony is it actually strengthens Hezbollah. Yeah, Hezbollah has it. been strengthened both times uh, that, uh, that Israel has invaded. But just on this point about October 7th, the conflict, you can't understand it by going back to the start of 2023. You can't even really understand it by going just back to 1948. To really understand uh, the, the conflict, you have to look for the roots of the violence in the Middle East. And Britain has its fingerprints all over it yeah. with the, the Balfour do- Declaration um, during the First World War, promising uh, the, the land of historic Palestine to both the Jewish people and the Arab people, then playing a game of divide and rule between the Arabs and the Jews, training up terrorist Jewish organizations like the Ergun and the Haganah in, in the 1930s, um, whilst putting down Palestinian resistance and then allowing them to, to volunteer with the British army and then saying to the Jewish people, oh, you can't actually uh, take this land anymore. They had created a Frankenstein's monster uh, in the Middle East. And that is how the Isra- Israeli state was proclaimed. Yes. Every point in the, in the war we have seen, um, the, the permanent wars that we've seen in the Middle East since that point, we have seen Britain provide diplomatic cover uh, for for the actions of the Zionists. But if you just look at the last 76 years, you look at the map, you can see who the aggressor yeah, is. You right. can see is who is deprived of a homeland. But of course, they're not so keen of getting the map out and talking about the mm. history. It must begin at this point in order for their lies to make any sense. Yes, that's it. I think that's the, that is going to be a really important thing that we get across in all of our public meetings, our rallies, the branch meetings next week is that yes it's the anniversary of the of the 7th of october but this is a a struggle a conflict that goes back a long way and that was initiated by and is entirely the blame for it is entirely on the doorstep of british imperialism especially and western imperialism in in general i think understanding that will also form a big part and it's part of a a big event that we've got coming up basically uh the revolution festival is in november middle of november Mm. over a weekend and it is, we are billing it, we're pushing it as an anti-imperialist conference. Yes. And and on the agenda are things like the crimes of British imperialism and, and the role that it has played both in the past and today. It's topics of that type. There's a, there's a big Books Not Bombs rally, which Fiona will speak at. There's a, a re- going to be a really important plenary session on, on world relations today, the situation of imperialism today, dealing with, yes, with the Middle East, but also with Russia and Ukraine and Europe, the role of US imperialism in general. Alan Woods is going to be speaking of that from the, from the Revolutionary Communist International. And, uh, and there'll be all kinds of other, other talks around imperialist questions, including historical stuff, uh, Britain in, in Ireland, for example. Um, <clears throat> And uh, and I think Fiona is also speaking on the end of apartheid in South Africa and how that came about, which is obviously relevant to yeah. to the struggle in Palestine today. Um, <clears throat> so from that point of view, it will be quite an Im- important anti-imperialist conference to understand, to be able to explain a lot of these points you were just uh, dealing with. Yeah. The Revolution Festival, we should also say, is, is a general school of communism. It will deal, there will be sessions on Marxist uh, philosophy, for example, both the kind of introduction and higher level discussions on artificial intelligence and human consciousness and, mm. and what AI tells us about that. That's obviously an important philosophical question. Stuff on Marxist economics, basic introductions like the labor theory of value, but also uh, more specific questions like the, the post-war boom, for example, and, and the crisis of the 1970s and, and how that took place. And then general discussions on climate change, on fighting the far right, for example, on Marxism versus anarchism. All of this will be covered. So that, I think, will be quite an important event, which we should be building up to. I guess we'll be advertising that at the demonstration this weekend as well. We should be able to find We that. absolutely will. Um, and I think it will be a real flagship event for the Revolutionary Communist Party, our first um, major event showcasing the depth and breadth of our, our ideas. And I think it comes at a really important time because... People have so many questions about the, about why the world looks the way that it does. People, I, I can imagine at the demonstration on Saturday, we are going to see pure, unadulterated rage. Mm. So much anger and rage against the system, against uh, against Netanyahu, but against Keir Starmer as well. And that's to be expected. People feel pissed off and they have every right to be. But I think what people 
probably are looking for more than just demonstrating uh, on the weekends is real clear answers that yes. explain the way that the world works, the way that it doesn't work for ordinary people, and uh, can explain the real nature of imperialism as well. Because there is a lot of confused ideas that exist on the left. I think we have to be very honest about that, about um, why Israel acts the way that it does. Mm -hmm. um, there is many confused ideas as to why Britain reacts to the, the conflict in the way that it does as well. And there is even more confusion when it comes to strategy and tactics as well. Our strategy and our tactics that we described earlier in this session flow directly from our revolutionary politics. Yes, And so I think where, where there is confusion, it's something that can be cleared up through discuss, coming and discussing with our comrades, through our agitation, reading our material. But this it will be a very important uh, weekend for clarifying what the tasks of communists are in fighting war and imperialism. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly it. Look, just just look, uh, earlier this week, I think it was, or last week, um, I was speaking to some comrades in in Canterbury at the Communist Society meeting at the University of Kent, and we were discussing this, and we were discussing the importance of theory as a way to uh, the importance of understanding what is actually going on. Yes. And one of the points I made is a point that the RCP comrades often make, which is that uh, if you went to the doctor with some kind of ailment and you said, uh, "Can you can you you know prescribe me something?" If if all the doctor did was say, "I'm so upset and angry that you're unwell. That yeah. really that really pisses me off. That's re I'm I'm furious about that." If that's all you got from the doctor, you you would leave a bit disappointed. What you actually want is someone who's uh, calm and sober-headed and measured, who says, right, here's here's why this is a problem. Here's what has caused this problem. And therefore, on that basis of understanding what has caused the problem, I can offer the, the solution, the diagnosis mm. uh, and the prescription. And that's the role that we have to play. That is the role of the Revolution Festival in this world, as you say, where there is so much going on at the moment and mm. so many confused ideas. And yes, a lot of anger and, and, uh, and sadness and fury and so on. It's to try and take a, a sober look at the whole thing, understand the process that are taking place, and on that basis offer some solutions, which are revolutionary solutions. Yes, and just, and just one thing I would add is, though though Starmer might talk of peace and ceasefire and uh, milk and honey uh, points, we should make no mistake, this is a government of war. This is a government that is incredibly hawkish. Um, it was hawkish before the Ukraine war broke out mm. uh, in, in pushing Ukraine into, uh, into war with Russia and then continuing the suffering of the Ukrainian people as well. It, uh, it was Keir Starmer personally is someone that wrote uh, a, a cringeworthy love letter to NATO. I remember yeah, you writing yeah. a response about that That's at the right. time, about it being this peacemaking, uh, peace, peaceful force. It was uh, defensive rather than offensive. Um, and Keir Starmer is hellbent on continuing to support Israel as well. What we have seen uh, in, in Britain is uh, a government that is is very uh, is is very clear on what its tasks look like for the next five years. Remilitarization, more billions of pounds to uh, to uh, weaponry, mm -hmm. uh, more billions in, in military aid elsewhere across the uh, across the world. This is only going to continue, and it's only going to get worse. It's, it's part of a global trend of remilitarization, and with that in mind, it's better to understand your enemy now yes. in order to act uh, in the future. That's exactly it. And so, uh, and that is why we would obviously encourage as many people as possible to come to the Revolution Festival. Uh, you can you can find it online, revolutionfestival.co.uk, and you can also find the information on communist.red. The tickets are forty pounds. It's held in central London over over that weekend in November. So, uh, I think we'll leave it there with an appeal for everybody to come to the Revolution Festival and, of course, to join the Revolutionary Communist Party if they have not done so already to help us in. In this fight that we've been outlining today, um, and we will see either you or Fiona or somebody else on the podcast next week. Yeah, thanks for inviting me.